Anatomy of Peterson Difficulty Index that is commonly used. Then Surgical Anatomy, Surgical Steps of Extraction of Impacted Teeth and Complications in Extraction of Impacted Teeth. Moving to definition, according to WSO, impact in teeth is defined as an impacted teeth is any tooth that is prevented from reaching its normal position in the mouth by tissue, bone, or under tooth. So, the presence of any physical barrier is most important in case of impacted teeth. And most commonly, in clinical scenario, what we find is tooth material and jaw size discrepancy. Because the size of the jaw is small and the size of the tooth is large, so what happens? The tooth which erupts at the last will get impacted. And most commonly, the formula gets, into, gets erupted at the age of 70 to 21 years. So if there is not sufficient space, it will get impacted. Okay, so the frequency of impaction is reverse of eruption. The tooth which gets erupted at first will less likely to get impacted. And in reverse order, if the tooth which is which gets erupted at last are more likely to get impacted. So that horn or tooth are more commonly gets impacted. In this similarity, in case of maxillary canine, they are more commonly gets impacted. Again, the second premolar will more commonly get impacted. And the least frequently, the least, the least frequent impaction is central incisor and first molar tooth because those two tooth gets erupted first at the age of six to seven years. So the central incisor and first molar at least likely to get impacted. So what is the difference between impaction versus retention? There, retention. there is something called as retention. So in, in case of impaction, cessation, there is cessation of the eruption of a tooth caused by a clinically or radiographically detectable physical barrier in the eruption path or due to an abnormal position of the tooth. Okay. In case of retention, if no physical barrier can be identified and an explanation for the cessation of eruption of a normal placed and developed tooth zone, then it is known as retention. For so in case of impaction, there must be presence of any physical barrier, either insufficient space or presence of thick bone or presence of seven tooth, second molar tooth. So due to any physical barrier, if the tooth could not erupt into the occlusion, then it is known as impaction. If there is no any physical barrier, though tooth has not been erupted, then it is known as, it is the case of retention. If you see the chronology, in case of maxillary third molar, first evidence of calcification is seen at the age of 7 to 9 years. In manual third molar, the first evidence of calcification is present at the age of 8 to 10 years. And in case of canine, at the age of 4 to 6 months. Crown completion will take place at the age of 12 to 16 years in maxillary third molar. In case of mandibular also, it's 12 to 16 years. But in case of maxillary mandibular canine, 6 years. We have considered here only maxillary mandibular third molar and canine because only these teeth are more, gets more commonly impacted. Okay, you will less frequently get any other tooth which are impacted. Other tooths rarely gets impacted. So we are considering only third molar in the canine. Eruption will take place at the age of 17 to 21 years in case of third molar, in the age 11 to 13 years in case of canine. Root completion will take place at the age of 18 to 25 years in case of third molar, in case of maxillary and mandibular canine, it's 14 to 15 years. So normally what happens when the tooth gets erupted, the root is not completed yet. Apical foramen is not formed, apex is, is not closed. So the general rule is, in case of deciduous teeth, apical foramen or apex will form after 12 to 18 months of eruption. Okay, that is one after one or one and a half years after the eruption, the root apex will be gets completed in case of deciduous teeth or primary teeth. In case of permanent teeth, the apical third will be formed or the apical foramen will be formed after two to three years of eruption. Okay. So usually when tooth gets traumatized, the most commonly traumatized tooth is maxillary anterior teeth. And in young age, let's say the patient is just seven, eight years where the apical foramen is not formed. In that case, if the root tooth is fractured, if the pulp is exposed, then you can do the normal root canal treatment because the apical foramen is not from it. It takes about two to three years for a apical third of the root to form. So in that case, you have to do either apexification or apexogenesis. So if any tooth fails to erupt beyond two years of expected time, then it should be considered unlikely to erupt. erupt. In case of third molar, it's the normal eruption time is 17 to 21 years. So if the Tooth is not, erup not erupted till the 23 years of age, then it is less likely to get erupted. Then you can consider it is impacted. After that, you have to take the radiograph, you have to diagnose. Sometimes it may be missing. 
or it may get impacted. The impaction are also various types. It may be complete bony impaction. You can't see clinically anything. It may be only soft tissue impaction. And most of the time, it can be partial impaction where some of the cone part is inside the bone and some part is visible in the oral cavity. If you see the etiology of impaction, there are various systemic factors and local factors. The systemic factors are endocrine deficiencies like hypothyroidism, hypopituitarism, febrile disease, Down syndrome, irradiation. In such cases, the, most of the teeth gets impacted. The local factors are prolonged deciduous teeth retention, malpose tooth germs, arch length deficiency. It is the most common reason for coronary impaction, arch length deficiency, and tooth, arch length and tooth material discrepancy. It may be due to odontogenic tumors or abnormal eruption path or clear flip and palate. In case of clear flip and palate, which tooth is impacted? Canine tooth gets commonly impacted in case of clear flip and palate. So, in case of clear flip and palate, we have to do bone graft. There is a regular cleft as well. So, you have to do bone graft before the eruption of canine tooth at the age of 9 to 11 years. So that the canine tooth will erupt in its normal position. And it is known as secondary alveolar bone grafting, SABG. In case of cleft lip and palate, for cleft palate, you have to do secondary alveolar bone grafting and you have to take the bone graft from anterior alveolar crest. So, question of impaction is just a reverse of eruption order. The tooth which gets erupted at last uh, are more likely to get impacted. Okay. So, the mandibular formula is most common impaction followed by maxillary formular, then maxillary cuspid, then mandibular bicuspid premolars, then mandibular canine, then maxillary premolar, and maxillary central followed by maxillary lateral incisors. So, impaction of first molar or incisor is uncommon in both arches because they get erupted at first. And I think you know that the sequence of eruption is slightly different in mandible and maxilla. In case of mandible, canine erupts before premolar, but in case of maxilla, the premolar erupts before canine. That's why the maxillary canine gets impacted commonly. Also, the six gets erupted at the age of six, uh, six and seven years, so there is insufficient space for five. Second premolar to erupt, so the like, second premolar also gets impacted. Now, the problem with impacted teeth, you can see the pericoronal abscess present in the first figure. The most common complication of impacted tooth is pericoronitis or pericoronal abscess. The food gets impacted between the soft tissue and impacted teeth, and it will lead to infection in pericoronal abscess. When there's, there is pericoronal abscess, Surrounding area is in the state of cellulitis. It will lead to, it may lead to buccal space infection. As you can see, the, the radius area, it is a case of buccal space infection due to impacted mandibular third molar tooth. Another problem with the impacted tooth is, it will lead to carries to the distal surface of the seven. No doubt, it will lead to carries to eight as well, occlusal surface of eight, because the food will get lost between the seven and eight, and it will lead to carries of the occlusal surface of eight and distal surface of a seven. Once the carries has been started, patient will be asymptomatic. What happens? The carries get extended, and once it reaches to the pulp area, then patient will have severe pain. In the, and in this condition, once the, there is severe pain, if you take the radiograph, you will find that the pulp is also involved. Now, in this condition, you have to remove both seven and eight. Because the root gets completely carriers, the pulp is involved. You can't do the root canal treatment and crown in this case, in late cases. So you have to remove if the tooth is impacted, if it has been locked at the distal surface of the second prim, second molar tooth, you have to remove the eight as a, you have to remove the eight as soon as possible so that at least you can save the second molar tooth. Another complication associated with impacted teeth is presence of dentizer assist. Dentizer assist is commonly associated with impacted tooth, impacted hormone, and the location of the dentizer assist, most common location for dentizer assist is posterior region of the mandible for, for dentizer assist, adesal, ondogenic keratocyst, or amyloblastoma, all of them are commonly found in the posterior region of the mandible. This is another condition of pericoronitis, most common complication of impacted teeth is pericoronitis, okay, it will lead to severe pain, it is in the cellulitis stage, and the problem with this tooth is whenever the patient bite, as there is edematous swelling, inflammatory swelling in the peripheral, on this flap, 
So when you were passing that, passing will have severe pain. So in such in such condition, what you can do is, if the patient has a severe so mouth opening is reduced, if the tooth is impacted, so it's difficult to do the when it is difficult to do the surgery, do treatments. Then in such condition, you can remove the maxillary formula so that the maxillary formula tooth will not get impinges over the occlusal surface of impacted it. So at least patient will have symptomatic relief. Once the mouth opening is adequate, infection has been subsided. Then you can extract the or do the surgery for third mouth. Now, indication for the involve of impacted three impacted teeth. A strong indication for the involve of impacted third molar should be complemented with a strong contraindication to its retention. AUX mode. The indication for removal of impaired teeth is dental caries. Dental caries on distal surface of second molar or occlusal surface of third molar. Prevention or treatment of recurrent pericoronitis. The most common complication of impaired teeth is recurrent pericoronitis. If there is a first episode of pericoronitis, they say you must prescribe some medication, antibiotic, it will subside. If there is recurrent pericoronitis, if it is a second, uh, second cycle or third cycle, if there is a recurrent pericoronitis, then you have to remove the involved tooth. And another uh, reason for extraction is sometimes they say that you can do the upper colectomy in case of third molar. Usually, the periodontists prefer to do the upper colectomy in case of impacted third molar. But the problem with upper problem with upper colectomy is again it will get again there will be recurrence. The soft tissue will grow, the soft tissue will regrow, and again it will form the pericoronal fab, and again it will lead to pericoronitis. Pericor so we don't prefer upper colectomy for the treatment of recurrent pericoronitis in case of impacted hot molar. The definitive treatment is you have to remove the tooth. And another problem with upper colectomy is once you remove the upper colon, there is a space will be found on the distal surface of it. In the soft tissue, again, the food will get impacted over the distal sur surface and the soft tissue, distal surface of it and soft tissue. Again, it will lead to severe soft tissue infection. Another indication is orthodontic consideration if you are planning to do the orthodontic treatment and most commonly if you are planning to distalize the molar tooth, then in such cases, you have to remove the impacted hard molar, otherwise you can't distalize the other molar tooth and premolar tooth. Prevention of ondogenic cyst and tumor, as you know, the dentigerous cyst, ondogenic keratocyst, or amyloblastoma are commonly present in the hard molar area, so it's better to remove the impacted tooth before. Root resorption of adjacent teeth, the impacted teeth will call root resorption of the adjacent teeth. Most commonly, the impacted teeth will cause resorption of the root of seven. And in case of impacted canine, it will cause root resorption of lateral incisor. So in order to prevent the resorption of adjacent teeth, you have to remove the impacted teeth. Okay, what will the treatment of impacted canine? What will we do? Either we will go for orthodontic extrusion or extraction. Okay, surgery got a nickel in it. Okay, you have to expose the canine, that's no, no, no problem. After that, what will you do? Whether you will extrude the tooth orthodontically, orthodontically by using spring elastics or you, you, you want to remove the tooth surgically, you want to extract the tooth. So the first line of treatment is always you have you have to save the teeth. You should try to save the teeth. So it depends on the angulation of the teeth. If the angulation of teeth is more than 40 degree, then you have to remove the teeth. In that condition, you can't extrude the tooth orthodontically. If the angulation of the teeth is less than 30 degree, if it is straight, then you can extrude the tooth orthodontically. You can do the orthodontic extrusion. You can attach, you can you have to do bending or bonding on the crown region, then you can apply either elastic or spring, close coil spring, and you can extrude the tooth orthodontically. So you have to see the angulation of canine in radiograph. 
if it is straight, if it is less than, if the angulation is less than 40 degree, then you can extrude the tooth. If the angulation is more than 40 degree, then you have to remove the tooth surgically. Another indication is tooth under dental prosthesis. If you are planning to place any complete denture and if, it is, if there is presence of impacted teeth, you have to remove that because if you don't remove the teeth, what will happen? Once you, the patient start to wear denture, there will be resorption of bone. Once the bone gets reserved, the prosthesis will impinge over the impacted teeth. The soft tissue present between the prosthesis and the impacted teeth will get traumatized and it will lead to severe pain. So you have to remove the impacted teeth before fabrication of any prosthetic denture. Prevention of jaw fracture, the chances of angle fracture is high if there is presence of impacted tooth because the area where it is, it must be filled with the cortical bone and cancellous bone that is occupied by the tooth. So the bone is thin with, and in such condition, the chances of angle fracture is very high. So the angle fracture is most commonly associated with impacted tooth. Okay. On the reason is impacted tooth may be associated with dentigerous cyst or any other pathology in such condition also. Again, what will happen? There will be bone resorption. So the bone is weak and the chances of fracture is high, even in the case of minor trauma. Management of unexplained pain. It is said that the trauma may cause periodontal pain due to impingement over the distal surface of seven. So if you can't, if the patient is complaining of pain, and if you don't find any other pathology for the reason of pain, then in such condition, you may remove the trauma. The pain will be relieved, but it is uncertain. It is only a last option. The contraindication for the involved of impacted teeth. When we will not remove the impacted teeth? The most common relative contraindication is extreme of age because what happens in case of old age in geriatric patient, healing capacity is less, so it will take a prolonged time. Also, the tissue laxity is very high, chances of space infection, hematoma, echimosis is very high, longer recovery periods, difficulty due to most densely calcified bone. In old age patient, the bone is more calcified, more dense, so you can't luxate the tooth easily. You have to remove more bone, there will be more swelling. Bone removal is more due to reduced parental ligament space. The parental ligament space is also less. So, in case of extreme of age, in geriatric patient, it's better to better don't remove the impacted teeth until and unless there is some complication. If you are planning for prosthesis or if it is associated with any pathology, then you have to remove. Otherwise, in case of asymptomatic impacted tooth, it's better to leave as it is. Wait and observe. Another problem is surgical damage to adjacent structure. If benefit less than the complication, extraction should not be done. If the most of the time while we do the various surgery where the third nerve tooth is associated with the inferior lower nerve. Sometimes what happens, the inferior lower nerve passes through the third molar tooth. Then in such condition, we have to section the tooth and then you have to remove. So if it is associated with any uh, inferior lower nerve or neurovascular bundle, or the chances of fracture is high if it is present near the lower border of the mandible. So you have to compare whether the, with the benefit and complication. If the benefit less than complication, it's better to postpone the extraction until and unless there is some complication. If there is any complication, then only you plan for extraction. Other is compromised medical status. If the patient has uh, uncontrolled diabetes, if the patient is leukemic, if the patient is under chemotherapy, if the patient has undergone radiotherapy, in such cases, the chances of complication is very high. In such cases, again, it's better to not to extract. Now, there's something called NICE guidelines for the involved of who's done with NICE stands for National, National Institute of Clinical Excellence. It is guidelines from UK. There is no any guidelines in Nepal. We have to follow the international guidelines. So it was, it is National, National Institute for Clinical Excellence. Guidelines for involved wisdom teeth. It was given in 2000, March, and it is commonly followed in the UK. It is a guidelines from UK, and it's a world, it is used worldwide. There are three guidelines. The first one says, the practice of prophylactic removal of pathology free impacted heart nerves should be discontinued in the National Health Survey. What happens is, Previously, what they think due to the presence of third nerve, the chances of pericoronaritis is very high. It will damage the adjacent seven. So it's better to remove the third nerve tooth at the age of eight to nine years. That is also known as prophylactic odontectomy. Have you heard that term in periodontic or no? Prophylactic odontomy. 
So previously it was thought that the formula will create a problem, problem. So it is better to remove the formula tooth at the age of eight to nine years. That is known as prophylactic odontomy. So this guideline says that it should not be removed because we have to wait because if it is not sure that the, all the formula will create a problem because there are many formula which erupts normally and it is present in the occlusion. It, it also helps in the function. So the prophylactic removal of impacted teeth Pathology free impacted formula should be discontinued. It should not be done now. The second point says that surgical removal of impacted formula should be limited to those with evidence of pathology, such as unrestorable caries, fractured tooth, non treatable pulpal or peripagal pathology, pathology of follicle, including cyst and tumor, osteomyelitis, and tooth impeding surgery like orthognathic surgery, implant surgery, or tumor rejection. If that formula is associated with this pathology, then you have to remove the tooth, otherwise you don't have to remove the tooth. Okay, if the formula is associated with any dentitis assist, or if it is associated with amyloblastoma or odontogenic keratosis, because the chances of recurrence is very high in case of odontogenic keratosis. And you have to prevent the recurrence in case of odontogenic keratosis or amyloblastoma, the tooth which is associated, which is associated with that pathology has to be removed, otherwise the chances of recurrence is very high. And if you are planning to do the orthognathic surgery, again, in case if you are planning to do the orthognathic surgery, you have to give the osteotomy cord just posterior to the second molar area. So you have to remove the formula six months to one year before orthognathic surgery. Okay. Orthognathic surgery is a complex uh, procedure. You have to plan at least one year before, and then you have to start the orthodontic treatment. You have to remove all that formula. And after one year, once the orthodontic treatment is completed, you have to remove you have removed all that formula. The bone is well deformed. After that only, you can give the osteotomy cord. So in case of formula, the prophylactic removal is contraindicated. You should, you must not remove the formula uh, toothward at an early age. On the other, if it is associated with any pathology, then you have to remove. Otherwise, you must not remove the formula tooth. The third one says, a specific attention is drawn to plaque formation in pericoronitis. Plaque formation is a risk factor, but is not itself an indication for surgery. The evidence suggests that a first episode of pericoronitis, unless particularly severe, should not be considered an indication for surgery. Second or subsequent episodes should be considered the appropriate indication for surgery. That is, if there is pericoronitis in the first stage, it, if, it, if it, the patient is suffering from peri, pericoronitis for the first time, you must not remove the tooth. Until unless it is very severe, if there is buccal infection, if there is trismus, if there is severe space infection, then you have to remove, otherwise, you have to advise the medications. Once it is controlled, then you have to wait and observe. Again, if the patient has suffered from the same pericoronitis, if there is recurrent pericoronitis, then in the, in the either in the second stage or third, third stage, you can remove the tooth, but you must not remove the tooth for pericoronitis if it is first episode. So if it's a first episode of pericoronitis, you have to advise the medication, do not extract the teeth. Again, if the patient suffered from the same pericoronitis in the and if it is second episode or third episode, if there is recurrent pericoronitis, then only you should 
remove the tooth. So you must remember these three guidelines. It is important practically. Now, classification system for impacted mandibular formulas. There are various classification, like George, yeah, it was given by George Winter classification, another was given a Pale and Gregory classification, then Killy and Clays. Kelly and case classifications in GR Ogden method and last one is ADA, American Dental Association and American Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery Classification. Second to George in window classification, it is based on the relationship of the long axis of impacted tooth in relation to the long axis of the second molar. So it is a various types like mesoangular impaction, vertical impaction, horizontal impaction, and distoangular impaction. In addition, there is also sometimes buccal version and lingual version or there is inverted or torsi version that is unusual position. So you have to compare the, you have to measure the angulation between the long axis of the second molar and the long axis of the third molar. So depending on that, between these two angles, it may be major angular that is most common followed by horizontal or vertical or distal angular. On the classification was given by Pale and Gregory classification. It is based on relation of tooth to the ascending ramus of mandible and to the distal surface of the second molar. It is again of three types, class one, class two, and class three. In class one, there is sufficient space is present between the anterior border of the ramus and the distal surface of the second molar. If the sufficient space is present between the distal surface of ramus and the anterior, sorry, distal surface of seven, second molar and anterior border of the ramus, then it is considered class one or quantitatively you have to measure the major distal distance of major distal width of the third molar and you have to compare this width with the distance between the posterior surface of seven and anterior border of the ramus. So if the distance between the posterior surface of seven and anterior border of ramus is greater than the major distal width of the eight, then it is considered it is class one, the space is sufficient. In class two, what happens? The distance between the distal surface of seven and anterior border of the ramus is less than the major distal width of the eight, then it is considered the space is inadequate, it is class two. In case of class three, anterior border of the ramus is present just adjust into the second molar, it is completely impacted, it is considered as class three. On the classification, again given a Pale and Gregory, it is based on relative depth of the third molars in bone. So shows the superior inferior relationship of the tooth in relation to the occlusal plane. So you have to compare the occlusal plane of seven with the occlusal plane of eight. If the occlusal level of seven and eight is at the same position, it is considered as position A. In case of position B, occlusal surface of eight is present between the occlusal surface of seven and the cementing angle junction of seven. If the occlusal surface of eight is present above the cementing angle junction of seven and below the occlusal surface of seven, then it is considered it is in position B and it is the most common. In case of position C, the occlusal surface of eight is present below the cementing angle junction of seven. Then it is considered as position C. Next is clean K classification. It is based on the angulation position. It is same as Winter's classification. Based on the state of eruption, it can be either completely erupted or partially erupted or unerupted. Based on the roots, number of roots may be fused roots, there may be presence of two roots, or there may be presence of multiple roots. Based on the root pattern, it may be either surgically favorable or surgically unfavorable. Okay, what do you mean by surgically favorable and surgically unfavorable? When we can say it is a surgically favorable route or there is a surgically unfavorable route? How will you decide that? During extraction, you always apply the elevator at the major buccal line angle, right? You can't apply the elevator from the distal side. So whenever you apply the pressure, so the tooth you want that tooth should extrude occlusally and distally. So if the curvature of the root is present distally, it is considered as favorable because it is the direction is in the direction of tooth movement. So if the root is curved distally, it is known as favorable, surgically favorable. In contrast, if the 
root is dilacerated majorly or root is bent there majorly then it is called like it is considered as surgically unfavorable because in such condition if you apply the pressure at the mesiobuccal line angle the root will fracture that's why it is called surgically un unfavorable fortunately luckily most of the tooth hair is dilacerated distally okay. and there is gr ogden method it is similar again you have to compare the distance between the roots of second and third molar with that of first and second molar you have to measure the distance between the distal root of 7 and mesial root of 8 and you have to compare it with again the distance between the mesial root of 6 and distal root of 7 okay so if a is greater than b that is if the distance between the distal root of 7 and Major root of 8 is greater than the distal root of 6 and major root of 7, it is considered it is major angular. If both are equal, then it is considered as vertical and just opposite. If it is less, then it is considered as distal angular. On this combined American Dental Association and American Association of Maxillofacial Surgery classification. So based in clinical and radiographic interpretation of the tissue overlying the impacted teeth, it may be either soft tissue impaction. It may be partial, partial bony impactions. Some part of the crown is present inside the bone, some is present outside the bone. It may be complete bony impaction. All the tooth structure is present within the bone or it may be complete bony impaction with unusual surgical complication like it may be associated with inferior canal. Inferior canal may pass through the tooth or, inferior, or the tooth root may impinge over the inferior alveolar canal. Clinical evaluation diagnosis of impacted permanent teeth involves clinical inspection that discloses the absence of tooth in its normal position combined with radiographic assessment showing the position of unerupted teeth. The radiographic imaging involves intraoral radiographs like intraoral periapical radiograph or occlusal radiograph. It's always better to take two radiographs, two plane radiographs perpendicular to each other for, so that you will know the exact position of unerupted and impacted tooth. Because if you take only OPG or IOPA, you will know the position of the tooth major distally, but you do not don't know whether the tooth is present buccally or lingually. So in order to know the position of the tooth accurately in the buccolingual position, we have to take another radiograph. Most commonly, we prefer occlusal radiograph. External radiograph, you can take either OPG or lateral cephalometric radiograph. OPG is commonly for preferred. Or you can do the CT scan or CBCT for impacted tooth. It's not CT scan is not required. You can pro proceed with CBCT if it is associated with un uncommon complication. If it is associated with inferior neurovascular bundle of inferior canal, if it is present near the lower border of the mandible, if it is associated with any dental cyst or something, then you can go for either CBCT preferably or sometimes CT scan as well. If it is a complex, if it uh, that hormone is associated with amyloblastoma or any other pathology, then you have to do the CT scan. Another method for localization technique is either you, you can use tube seat method or a buccal object rule. It is also known as slow rule, same side lingual, opposite side buccal. You might have studied in radiology. You have to take the same radiograph at different position. You have to shift the position of the tube. And accordingly, you will, you will know if the image shifts on same side, then it is considered the object is present lingually, same side lingual, and just opposite. If the image is shifted to the opposite side, it is considered that the object is present buccally. We see it as a SLOV rule, same side lingual, opposite side buccal rule. OMR class, what was it? OMR class, what is it? Oral medicine in radiology. And there is periapical occlusal method. Easy is just take one IUP, intraoral periapical radiograph, and other occlusal radiograph you will know the exact position of the formula. So before doing any surgery, you must have concrete plan. You must know the exact position of the tooth so that you don't have to explore surgically. In perioperative evaluation, in case of extra oral, you have to see the signs of swelling and redness of the cheek area, whether the lymph node is enlarged or not, whether it is tender or not, most commonly, 
the formula is associated with submandibular lymph node. Submandibular lymph node may be enlarged, it is standard. Or anesthesia or paresthesia of the lower lip, if the formula, if the mandibular formula has traumatized the inferior node due to infection or due to any reason, there may be anesthesia or paresthesia of the lower lip. Intraorally, you have to see the mouth opening and an evidence of Christmas. Because in case of pericornitis, this face infection commonly patient will have Christmas. The mouth opening is inadequate. In such case, again, you can't extract the tooth, it's difficult. And sometimes what happens? There may be severe infection that if you leave as it is, it sometimes it is not controlled by the medication as well. Because if the pus formation is there, the antibiotic will not reach to the area of pus. So it will not subside and if the vocal space infection gets spread to the submandial, submandial area, submandial area, it will lead to Ludwig's angina, so it may compromise the airway. In such condition, again, you have to give the incision through the submandibular approach. You have to give the submandibular incision and you have to drain all the pus. Then you have to see the state of eruption of tooth, whether it is completely impacted or partially impacted, whether bony impaction or soft tissue impaction is present. Then you have to see for signs of pericoronitis, condition of first and second molars, a space present between second molar and senior ramus. That is the most important part. If space is insufficient, you have to remove the bone from the anterior border of the ramus. Then elasticity of oral tissue, if the patient is of young, if the patient is young as patient, then the bone is elastic, it's comparatively easy to remove. If the patient is geriatric, then the bone is compact, the laxity of the bone is less, so you have to remove more bone it's, and, it's, and it's difficult to extract, do extraction in such geriatric patients. Then size of the tongue. The difficulty index for the removal of impacted mandibular formulas, it was given by Peterson. We also say it has a Peterson difficulty index. So, Depending on the score, you can identify whether it is easy to extraction or difficult or it's more difficult. So based on a special relationship, if the tooth is mesiangular, the score is one. If it's horizontal, then the score is two. In case of vertical, it's three. In case of distangular, the score is four. Similarly, depending on depth, if it is a position A, it is high occlusal level, a score is one in position B, medium occlusal level two, or position C, it is deep occlusal level, it's three. Similarly, depending on the relationship of ramus and the space available, in case of class one, sufficient space, the score is one. In class two, if the space is reduced, it is considered a scoring two. In case of class three, if there is no space, if it is present within the ramus, then the score is three. Now, after giving the score, you have to sum up them, and accordingly, you can identify whether it is easy or difficult. So total value, is, if the total value is between three to four, then it is slightly difficult. If it is between five to six, it is then moderately difficult. If it is the value is seven to 10, then it is considered as very difficult. So as shown in here, what will its total score? What is its angulation? Will it be mesiangular, vertical, distangular, or horizontal? Vertical. If it's vertical, then what will be the score? Six. No, for angulation, if, if it is mesiangular, it's one. If it's horizontal, two. If, it's, if it is vertical, then the score is three. So for angulation, the score is three. What is its position level? It is at the occlusal level, so position is A. So the score is one, so three plus one. Now, what is the special relationship? It is level B, level two, because some part is present anterior to the ramus, some part is present posterior to the ramus, so the score is two. So three plus one plus two total is six. So if the score is five to six, it is moderately difficult. You know, most important part, war line. Most commonly, they ask this question from this war line. W stands for white, A for amber, R for red. White, amber, and red lines. It was first described by George Winter, and it stands for W for white, A for amber, and the R for red lines. These are imaginary lines drawn on the standard radiograph. 
it can be done either in the in our period pack of radiograph or OPG. So white line is drawn along the occlusion surface of the erupted mandibular molars and extended posteriorly over the third molar region. It indicates the depth of third molar. Amber line, this line is drawn from the surface of the bone lying distal to third molar to the crest of the interdental septum. Between the first and second molar, you have to extend the line from the alveolar crest present between the first and second molar and, molar and it is extended till the distal surface of the third molar. In the red line, it is a perpendicular line dropped from the amber line to an imaginary point of application of elevator. So when we want to place the elevator, we have to measure the distance from amber line to that point. Commonly, it is present at the cemento enamel junction. The more deeply embedded the teeth, the longer the red line and more difficult the extraction is to perform. If red line increases by 1 mm, difficulty increases by 3 times. Under his war face assessment, it was given a McGregor. Again, the war face stands for W for winter's classification, S for height of mandible, A for angulation of third molar, R for shape of root, F for follicles, and E stands, e stands for exit, path of exit. In winter's classification, if it is horizontal, score is 2, in distal angular 2, major angular 1, vertical 0. It's different from Peterson difficulty index. It's a little, little bit difficult, but you have to remember. We have to remember the full form, and I don't think you need to know the score. Just remember the full form and what are its subtypes. In case of height of mandible, if it is 1 to 30 mm, then it is considered a score is 0. In case of 31 to 34 mm, a score is 1, 35 to 39 mm, a score is 2. So if the height of the mandible is more, it's more diff very difficult to remove. And that's why a score is more. In case of angulation of formula, 1 to 50 degree, a score is 0, 60 to 69. A score is 1, 70 to 79. A score is 2, 80 to 89. A score is 3, 90 plus. A score is 4. If first one, 1 to 50, and it's 1 to 59. Okay, 1 to 59, some score is 0. Typing mistake wrong. Root shape, if it is complex, the score is 1, favorable curvature 2, unfavorable curvature 3. Unfavorable means if the root is curved majorly, it is unfavorable. If the root is curved distally, it is favorable curvature. Follicles, if it is normal follicle, score 0, possibly enlarge 1, enlarge 2. Path of exit, if the space is sufficient, the space available, the score is 0. Digital cusp is covered, the score is 1. If major cusp is covered, the score is 2. If both cusps are covered, the score is 3. It is warfare assessment given by MacRiver. Now, incidence of impaction. Mesangular impaction is a most common impaction which accounts for approximately 45% approximately of all impacted mandibular third molars, and it is least difficult to remove. It is easy to remove as compared to other tools. So, the mesangular impaction is more common and it is easiest to, to extract. And the vertical impaction consists of 40% of all impactions. For the horizontal impaction, it considers 10% or in intermediate in difficulty. Distangular impaction is only 5%. It is the most difficult to remove because in the case of distangular impaction, we have to remove more bone because it is, its curvature is present distally. You have to remove more bone from the distal area and occlusal surface. The factors which are determining the difficulty of surgery. So you have to consider this factor in case of less difficult, the, if the tooth is mesangular impaction, class 1 ramos, position A, if root is only one third to two third is formed, present in the younger patients, is, there is fused conical roots, white parental ligament space, elastic bone is present, present in the young patient, separated from the second molar, separated from inferior nerve, nerve if, and if it is soft tissue impaction, then the, if it is easy to remove, such impacted tooth in just opposite in case of more difficult when you consider it as more difficult if it is a distangular impaction if it is class 3 ramos class c depth long thin roots present in the older patient divergent curved roots narrow parental ligament space present in again in older patient dense elastic bone contact with second molar close to inferior nerve complete bony impacts in such cases it is comparatively difficult to remove the such impacted tooth a nerve injury assessment, most commonly when you extract the soft 
formula to think, we have to consider a neurovascular bundle. So chances of injury high is high if any of these seven conditions are present. And it can be seen in the OPG radiographic signs of proximity are if there is darkening of the roots, if the root is present within the canal, then there will be darkening of the apical third. If the root is deflected, if there is dilaceration, it is present just over the inferior canal. On the interruption of the cortical line, you must view the cortical bone or the superior inferior margin of the inferior canal. If the superior line of the inferior canal is interrupted, then it indicates that the root is the tooth is lying just over the neurovascular bundle. Again, the chances of injury is high in such cases. Narrowing of the roots, if it is narrow, root is narrow and it is present just over the inferior canal. Again, in such cases, the chances of injury is high. Darkening or and bifid root, diversion of the mandibular canal, and narrowing of the mandibular canal. In such cases, in these seven cases, the chances of nerve injury is more because in all these cases, the root is present just as the center of the neurovascular bundle, it might, or it might attach with the neurovascular bundle. In such cases, you may damage the nerve structure, and the patient will complain numbness over the chin area and the lips area. <coughs> Lingual nerve, it lies inferior and medial to the crest of lingual plate of mandible, below the crest for 2.28 mm and medial to the crest 0.58 mm. So, in case of lingual nerve, it is present just as a central third nerve. So, you must be careful that you should never place an instrument on lingual surface or lingual plate. Just reflect the gingiva and don't do any instrumentation on the lingual surface. Whenever you are going, sectioning the tooth or if you are removing the bone, you must not or you need not extend your ball beyond two thirds of the major mix, beyond two thirds of the buccolingual length of tooth. If you are sectioning the root tooth or crown, you must do sectioning on the buccal surface till two thirds or three fourths of his buccolingual width. And after that, you have to split the tooth. You should not extend till the lingual surface of the tooth. Otherwise, you will damage the, this lingual nerve. Okay. Surgical management, the steps in the surgical lingual is first you have to give the inferior nerve box or the anesthesia, then you have to give the incision, warts incision or modified warts incision. It's your choice whether you can give the releasing incision or envelope flap. It's better to give the envelope flap. Person will have least post operative healing time. Followed by you have to remove the bone, you have to do buccal guttering in all the cases, then you have to you have to section the tooth. Then you have to remove the distal bone as well, sometimes followed by tooth removal, then wound debridement, control of hemorrhage and bleeding, then wound closure, followed by post operative follow up. The parts of incision the incision has three parts. You have to start the incision, the inter incision starts from the buccal sulcus approximately at the junction of posterior and middle third of the second molar, passes upwards and extend it up to the distal buccal angle of the second molar at the gingival margin. Okay. From again, the distal buccal line angle, it is known as limb A, this circular incision is known as limb B, and posterior incision is known as limb C. So limb B is carried along the gingival previous of the third nerve, extending up to the middle of the exposed distal surface of the tooth. In case of limb C, it starts from the point where intermediate in gingival incision ended and is carried laterally towards the cheek and mucosal depth. This arm should be about Two centimeter long. So in distal area, you have to be careful. You have to extend your incision laterally. You must not go medial because you may enter into the lingual pouch. You may damage the temporal fibers of temporalis muscles or the tremolar vessels. So you have to extend your incision laterally in the posterior area. So limb C is not to be extended too distally because the chances of bleeding from the buccal vessels and other arteries is high. Post-operative trismus may be present due to temporalis muscle damage. The fibers of temporalis is also present in the interior border, of, interior border of the ramus. There may be chances of herniation of buccal fat pad or you may damage the lingual nerve. So lingual extension is also not indicated. In case of uninterrupted tooth, intermediate incision is not needed and limb A is extended up to the middle of the distal surface of the second molar. Okay. This is the warts incision where you have to extend your incision from the sulcus and you have to reach the distal buccal line angle of the second molar. Then you have to give the limb B cubicular incision followed by the distal limb C incision. 
in case of modified incision, if the formula is completely impacted, then you, do, you will not find the salt cost of the formula. In such cases, you have to start the incision from the first molar area. It is known as modified wards incision. Another variation can be you don't have to start in the first molar area, just you can start the incision in the distal vocal line of the second molar and you can directly you can extend the limb C. There is no limb B. Okay, that is also one of the variations. Another incision can be in of flap, even in case of third molar, you don't have to give the releasing incision, you can just raise the mucoperistal flap, in of flap, you don't have to give any releasing incision and you can remove the tooth. That's more comfortable for patient because healing, healing period is less. Incision is made horizontally along the crest of the ridge or in the buccal gingival crevice, has no vertical incision, it is done for shallow or superficial impacts and advantages. Is provides the broad base and fully covers the resulted bony cavity. There is little danger of violating any major anatomical landmarks and during the procedure, the inhaler flap can be extended as needed if still greater excess is required. But if you give the entire releasing incision, you can't extend your flap. So you have to plan before starting the surgery. But in case of cavicular incision, if you find that, if you, have, if you need to extend the incision, you can do during the surgery. Okay. In bone removal, to remove the bone obstructing the pathway for removal of the impacted teeth, the types are by consecutive sweeping action of board in layers or by you can use a chisel or osteotomy cut in sections. Now the question is how much bone has to be removed? Bone should be removed till we reach below the height of contour where we can apply the elevator. Extensive bone removal can be minimized by tooth sectioning. So you have to see the width of the third molar. You have to extend your guttering or you have to remove the bone till where there is maximum major dimension, major distal width of the tooth. It most, most commonly it is present in the cement in junction, but sometimes if the root are flared, then it's in such condition, you may have to extend your guttering till the middle third of the root. So commonly we have to remove the bone till the cement in junction. Okay, we'll continue tomorrow. Thank you.